and if you, if you ever move a hospital, you definitely become a fan of checklists. Um, so uh, thank you very much uh, to Daryl and the organisers for the um, invitation to um, uh, present today. And I'm sort of really just going to tell a story because this is not a very data-driven uh, presentation, as you can imagine. Uh, and um, <clears throat> it, it also intersects with the models of care. Clearly, this is not just my story. It's a story that involves a lot of people. And um, I, I do need to acknowledge uh, some people along the way. So we'll get to that shortly. Uh, so, uh, like many of you, I work in the Central Adelaide Local Health Network, which obviously is a bureaucratic construct, which means little or nothing to most people, certainly not to our patients. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the, the health structure, but of course where we work is the hospital where we spend our time, and that's where, uh, we, um, uh, where we associate with. Uh, and uh, in, in my case, most of my clinical time is spent here at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Um, and just some quick facts. Uh, it was very expensive. Uh, it's very big, uh, and it's full of technology, which is, to a variable degree, functional. Um, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> I don't really have that much time to talk about the, the hospital itself and the sort of design uh, challenges of it, uh, other than to say the size and the scale uh, and the number of different technologies involved in the building uh, are, are really make our clinical response to it and, and the moving into it uh, uh, was quite challenging. So just for a minute, I'd like to talk about the people now. Um, <clears throat> uh, obviously, you know, hospitals are, are all about people, and even though we talk a lot about the, the design, uh, it is really the people that make the job worth doing, uh, patients and, uh, and colleagues. Uh, and uh, in, in all of these kind of processes, there are some stars. And so it's really important for, for you, if you embark on this kind of thing, to, to, to be open and alert and understand uh, who is really making a great contribution. There are two of our stars in the audience, and many, actually more than two I can see from here. And so I'm not talking about the MER and the response team today, So, but uh, Arthur and Michelle are sitting down there uh, who did an extraordinary job uh, of helping us to move hospital. Uh, and um, uh, this, uh, all of these people made a, a big contribution along the way, but that person there uh, was an absolute star. And the reason I, I mention it, uh, her name is Jodie Kernick, uh, is actually, it's really important to understand uh, who that person is, who's the anchor, and how you can help that person if you're going to get, a, if you're going to do a job like this. Uh, and then uh, uh, some of the um, uh, the clinical folks who kind of stepped up um, uh, are, are just in the pictures. Uh, and this is the, the last person leaving the old Royal Adelaide, old Royal Adelaide Hospital. Uh, and moving um, uh, in a hospital is as much about leaving the hospital you leave behind as moving into the new hospital, uh, and that was a, you know, both an emotional and logistical uh, challenge. Uh, not so much of an emotional one for me, but uh, for, for many colleagues. So key challenges in the project were actually the design phase and the planning had been going on for an awfully long time, and it got to the point where actually that was counterproductive, and, and people were sort of paralyzed because you know the, the process had kind of become uh, a little bit opaque. Um, but for us, there were some things that were kind of challenging, and we were we were concerned because we were moving into a 100% single room environment, uh, and uh, you know there was just a lot of uh, a, a lot of uncertainty around the time of the move. Uh, and the reason that I mention this is because actually, where you have major uncertainty around really critical decisions, that's very distracting for people, and they find it very difficult to move away uh, from a, a, an uncertainty. Uh, and action some of the things that need to be done. So a key part of, uh, of our challenge was to, you know, to try and park some places and create a, safe, a, safe, a state of psychological safety and engagement for key people to embark on you know, tasks that needed to be undertaken. Uh, and, and into this space came a model of care. Now, to be honest, when I was a practicing clinician, when I did that for most of my time, I really didn't have any sense of what a model of care is. It just sort of didn't come up. I mean, you've got evidence that you apply in particular clinical contexts. It's either appropriate or it isn't. You know, you can evaluate it and so forth. But <clears throat> a model of care became the sort of huge issue when people said to us, well, what is your model of care? Uh, and and that became important for a number of reasons, and I just want to spend a minute talking about this. So a model of care is really how you do what you do, where you do it, uh, and the team that you do it with. It includes other issues like the rules, the money, um, and the sort of, you know, the, your, your, 
your context, and, and broadly in, in intensive care, all of that actually is really quite prescribed and transparent. You know, we've got the safety and quality healthcare stand, um, standards, we've got funding agreements, commissioned activities and targets, and all of that play into it. But there's another aspect to it, and that is, it's actually about a shared mental model of how you function within the organization that you function. And for, for the hospital move, it became a very big issue for us because people really needed to have a sense of certainty and security that the ICU could manage the move, that the patients would be safe. Uh, and that is part of you know, the great privilege of being an intensive care clinician is that you know, we, we get a lot of support and a lot of resources to do the work that we do, and people are very interested in what we do. So there was a lot of interest in how we were doing it. And as I began to unpack that and, and, and reflect on it and the interactions I had with various colleagues, it became clear to me that there were two additional aspects. One was people needed to feel that we could do it. And they felt, well, if you can do it, then we can do it. So we, we you know, because the different services, oncology, nuclear medicine, whatever it might be, they all had complex logistics. And they really needed to sort of feel we were coping making you know, visible and transparent progress in our organization. And then they thought, well, you know, the ICU team, are, are, you know, they're making progress, they're coping with it, and that was very engaging for them. Uh, the other issue is they also needed to know that we had enough bandwidth, enough sort of cognitive space and availability to be able to help them. Um, because you know, that's what we do. If they have problems you know, with patients, clinical deterioration, et cetera, then you know, we, are, we are there for them. Uh, and uh, so they really needed to feel that, you know, both coming up to and during the move, uh, that we, we had that, you know, we had systems and processes in place, communication channels, so that we were open uh, and available to them. And then the third point about this, which was really kind of important, was it was our interrogation of other services that actually helped them to, to unpick certain problems. When we started saying to them, well, we, we, we've, we've thought about these questions and we would like to ask you, you know, how you're going to manage this particular problem if you have a clinical deterioration in this setting, on what day are you going to stop doing these particular scans, operations, interventions, transfusions, you know, are you going to start, are you going to move here on this day, so, and you know, and Arthur and Michelle did a lot of that uh, clinical consultation um, with the MERS service, and that really helped other teams, because they thought, oh, well, we didn't think of that, actually, that's really good, well, we better kind of factor that into our plans. So that interaction from the intensive care was really important. So the intensive care has about three, almost 4,000 patients a year. And this was all the sort of, you know, the very obvious things that you all understand very well, the characteristics of the work that you do and where you do it. Uh, and we just really explained that. We did make some accommodations to the scale of the new environment. We sort of split up our teams a little bit. And because we were going through a a four, it's actually a 60 bedded unit, but we're working within a 48 bed footprint and we're running about 43 beds at the moment. Um, uh, always recruiting, if anybody's interested in moving to Adelaide. Very nice place to live. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, we did need to make some accommodations to the way we organize both the medical and nursing team structures. Um, uh, and as a consequence, uh, you know, we, we aspired to making some improvements in the quality of the care that we deliver. Uh, and in terms of one of the biggest changes was that we, we got a rid of, well, not rid of is a terrible thing, so we, we changed from having a, a, a special uh, HDU and to having the HDU patients now integrated in the, uh, uh, with, uh, within the other, you know, the, the four pods of the unit that are functioning. So all of those uh, aspects of things were, you know, that, those descriptions we had to, uh, you know, we had to reproduce again and again and again and explain to people. Uh, and I particularly, uh, as the unit director at the time, found it very confusing uh, as to why everybody was terribly interested in that. Uh, and that really led to my insights as to, you know, the degree of, of security people need to feel by having us engaged with their services. Uh, the other thing that we did was uh, we worked through some uh, clinical pathways uh, in consultation with other, um, uh, with other services uh, and talked about how we look after, you know, patients that we, we look after together in a collaborative manner, as I'm sure you all do. Uh, the, the important point about that was that it was actually the journey rather than the destination that was important. Many of these, you know, endless discussions and very good interactions resulted in documents that we now really no longer use and often don't refer to. But actually, we clarified a lot of, um, we did a lot of process mapping. 
uh, and we created a lot of shared mental models and more importantly you know we began to understand uh, and unpack some some critical differences in perception about what we do and how we do it and that was really quite helpful um, so these were the benefits that we uh, we really um, aspired to get from changing our model of care uh, and then um, this is just a random picture of the building uh, people love pictures of the buildings when other people of where other people work um, if you ever go to an international conference uh, there's always you know pictures of the buildings in which other people work I've never really quite got it but because <laughs> so, it's always a big building surrounded by a car park and they look sort of surprisingly sadly the same um, this, but the, there is a, there are many good aspects actually to the building and one of them is uh, these lovely courtyards uh, and because uh, we were uh, a little bit late moving into the building quite a lot of the gardens had matured by the time you know were beginning to mature by the time we moved so some of these uh, spaces are really quite good so one of the things that we did which was really important was we thought well if we're going to move uh, who are we going to move and how are we going to move them because again this was one of the sort of uh, sort of key uncertainties that everybody got stuck on and that was well, well could we move so the intensive care team were very were very stuck on the issue of what will we do if we can't move a patient? And the rest of the hospital was very stuck on, can you move all the patients you need to move in the time that is allocated to you? So we thought, well, the first thing we need to do is we need to understand how many patients we generally have, uh, because everybody has a, a view that, you know, we, we have always, we don't have enough beds and we've got too many patients. And, and I can see that if you're just within a bit of the unit and you have a clinical shift, you could really walk away from that clinical shift thinking, we don't have enough beds, you know, there isn't enough time, there's too many patients, because it, is, it, is, it does feel very chaotic. But actually, when we looked at how many patients there were every morning during a prolonged period of audit, uh, we thought, well, we, you know, we generally have around 35 patients every morning, and we've got a whole bunch of patients that are going to go to the ward. Nobody was really quite sure how many, so we thought, well, let's try and nail this down. So we developed just a very simple, you know, um, uh, categorization to do an audit from you know patients that are very sick to patients that are actually ready to go to the ward and then we just measured the number of those you know month after month uh, in an audit and we talked about the patients in the morning we have a morning kind of huddle around bed management and we asked some key questions every morning we asked the question you know if we were going to move today how many patients would we have to move how many patients would be going to the ward and were there any, are there any patients in the unit that we couldn't move today so one of the things that we found is that the category, category 5 patients are the patients that are the sickest in the light blue and you can see at the bottom here that those are actually pretty stable and we generally actually only had about one or two of those patients a day although we did have four of those patients for like a week in September 2017 or 2016 and that really you know I found that very stressful um, and then most of those patients that were very sick we found well after about three days, generally they could be moved. And we know that because obviously we move patients all the time. And that's one thing that was really fascinating is the other non-ICU world, they have no idea that we move patients all the time. They think, well, once a patient goes to ICU, they're going to stay there till they can do 10 sit-ups, 10 press-ups, and 10 burpees, and then they're going to go home. And then you think, well, no, you know, we take patients to the operating room, to the MRI scanner, to CT, to angio. And so that sort of stuff happens all the time. So most of those patients, we thought, well, we don't have that many of those, so that's good. And then we just had to think about, well, how many of the patients uh, in each of the categories did we have, and then how would we move those? So then we just really created another model of care. We've, we got some principles around, you know, what, what were the important issues, uh, and those were continuity of care, communicating with families, uh, making sure we had a plan. Uh, and then uh, we formed a multidisciplinary group with... Um, uh, the medical retrieval service, the ambulance service, some logistical folks, um, uh, and, uh, and, and internal uh, stakeholders, medical nursing, etc. And then we just met regularly and we did an awful lot of planning and an awful lot of talking. Uh, one of the things we had to think about was, well, what equipment do you need? Uh, and Jody did a really good you know, alignment of the kind of equipment you would need for each of those categories of patients. Uh, and then we made sure that we had those and we made up equipment packs. And then another um, issue that came up, which was really quite interesting, was of course how many of the patients had a transmission-based precaution. So we would have to think about that because we, that would affect the scheduling of how we would move those patients because the ambulance have to be cleaned down. And then after that, we did 
a little bit more auditing and we thought, well, if we were going to move today, uh, what do we have planned for the patients you know, uh, uh, over the course of today that might influence how we would schedule them and which patients we would choose to move on which day? At this point, we were still thinking, was it going to be a five-day move? Is it going to be a three-day move? And that was important for us because obviously we would have to run two ICUs and two uh, MER services during the period of the clinical move. Um, and then, uh, so that's just a list of all of the things that were happening on each of, you know, so we did that audit over a couple of months and, you know, all of the different things that, you know, happen every day, people going for pacemakers or people are on ECMO or whatever it might be. Uh, and that was useful to, for us to do some, uh, to do some planning. Another thing that we did, which is also quite obvious, um, uh, but it was really it was really fascinating to see how much interest again there was in this, was we did some we did some simulations. We actually moved uh, some mannequins uh, and we timed it, and we put them on trolleys, barouches, and we brought them down. We put them in an ambulance, and we went to this lift and then uh, this door, and then you know, and all of that, you know, all of that clarity, all of that repetition, a little bit like what Chris was talking about earlier on. The fact that we did all of that. Uh, it really made people feel very comfortable about, you know, about what we were doing. Uh, and then this, this man here, his name is Martin. He was another one of the uh, stars of the whole um, uh, episode. He was, um, he's a logistics expert, so he did an awful lot of the planning and the documentation and the reporting. Uh, because one of the things you really learn when you do something like this is it's not just about the ICU, it's about the whole hospital. And you really sort of, it's one of those times where you really feel like you're part of the bigger organization. Um, uh, and then we did some modeling. Um, uh, these are just, we planned the teams, the teams that would be at the site where people were leaving, the teams that would receive the patients, who would be in each team. Uh, and then, uh, then we did some modeling about, well, if we had the number of patients that we would normally have and the averages, these would go there, this is what we would do. Uh, so that's just a kind of schedule of, you know, these are the ones we would move, we would start. Uh, and. Um, uh, and that was really quite useful. Uh, in the weekend before the move, um, uh, I, uh, Arthas and I and other people spent time running around just checking on stuff and on people. So we saw all the ICU discharges, made sure they were okay. We saw people who had multiple neck calls. Uh, we checked in uh, with the medical and nursing colleagues on those parts of the hospital where you have higher acuity, you know, the neurosurgical ward, the coronary care unit and so forth. And we had checklists for equipment. Um, uh, and then we, you know, we made a schedule, uh, and all of that was uh, quite straightforward. Um, and then we just had a very quick checklist for each patient each day of go, no, go. So obviously anybody who was on greater than 80% of oxygen, 15 a peep, people who were prone on nitric, ECMO, balloon pumps, all of that, we thought, well, we won't move those on the first day. We don't need to. Um, and then we can either move them subsequently uh, and the hospital had really come, uh, were very clear and sort of said, if there's anybody that you're very worried about, you don't have to move them if you don't want to. Like, we'll provide whatever resources, money that you need to keep that person safe for as long as you need to. Uh, and, and that was really very helpful to us all. I think that made us feel really well supported. Um, uh, and, then, um, and then there was just a huge communication piece. And I really wasn't part of this, but I, I really have to... Uh, I have to just um, uh, say what a fantastic job you know the nursing team did in particular because people had endless questions. There was PowerPoint presentations on every single computer uh, all around the ICU, uh, and um, uh, and there was just you know frequently answer, asked questions and you know and people came up with all kinds of questions and then the equipment locations was really important. So uh, this one here, so um, there were maps of the new unit. Uh, about you know where are all the different you know, where the ultrasound machine is going to be where is the echo machine going to be where is the bronc going to be where are the airway trolleys going to be you know all of the stuff that people really needed to know um, uh, and uh, anyway these are just an example of some of the questions people asked um, so we moved uh, almost 300 patients in sort of two and a half days uh, in the ICU part of the move. Um, uh, I'll just come back to that. The IC part of the move was uh, 31 patients, uh, and we um, we moved. We were done by sort of uh, lunchtime on day three. Uh, so I just want to go back to that. One of the key sh strategies was uh, this. This was a ramp down unit. So this was a whole bunch of people that actually really pulled back our elective work 
uh, and the work that came into the Royal Adelaide in the sort of four weeks, four to six weeks before we moved. And that was really important because we went from sort of 700 patients uh, down to about 300 patients for the move. So I'm just finished. Um, uh, I just like this photo, so I just thought I'd put it in. A couple of other beefy blokes. Um, and, uh, and the important thing, uh, I guess, to say is that we were very much part of a broader organisation uh, and both how the organisation supported us and how we supported it uh, were critical to getting the job done.